They were among nature's most successful experiments in advanced weaponry. Cleaver jaws, jet propulsion, armor plating. Their mouths are big enough that they could swallow a small child whole. Each creature was a predatory pioneer. There was a tremendous amount of carnage going on constantly. There's nothing like it in the animal kingdom. They perfected the tools for hunting, killing, dismembering, and devouring prey. And then they passed them on. Prehistoric assassins. What makes a predator deadly? The lethal weapon it uses to close the deal. And when nature perfects a weapon, it keeps it, even after the killer disappears. This process of recycling traits, called convergent evolution, is as old as nature itself. Ever since life exploded in the Precambrian period, the ocean has been a testing ground for predators looking to gain an edge on their prey. As time goes on, the most innovative designs for destruction become apparent. One of the things we see throughout the history of life on our planet is sort of this continuous arms race between predators and prey. Only at the very bottom of the ecosystem did you have plant eaters and that sort of thing. Everything else ate everything else. 370 million years ago, in the shallow seas of the Devonian period, one marine assassin stood out above all others, Dunkelosteus. His predatory advantage, his lethal weapon, was second to none. A new kind of jaw that packed one of the most powerful bites of all time. But what prompted this innovation? Armor. Most Devonian prey had it, including plated fish called placoderms. As soon as there were predators, animals evolved uh, protection from those predators, some sort of armor or some kind of hard shell. They range from small armored organisms that were snuffling around on the bottom, feeding on detritus and things, uh, up to the large apex predators like Dunkelosteus. This was the original Jaws. A pioneer at using these revolutionary structures called Jaws, which evolved 410 million years ago from bones in their gills. Jaws are weapons that open wide, allowing predators to attack and devour much larger prey. But a jaw can also be used as a hammer to help crack a shell or stun prey. A hammer is a handy tool, but Dunkelosteus had an edge on other jawed placoderms, one that made it among the most deadly predators of all time. So Dunkelosteus represents one of the first times that these um, predators have been able, have developed a means of actually breaking down a larger prey item. Once you can do that, you can start eating anything in your environment. And Dunkelosteus did. One of the largest of the placoderms, it grew to an estimated 20 feet in length and weighed as much as an elephant. Its back half was a mass of sleek muscular tissue and its fearsome four foot wide skull was made of bony armor plates. But Dunkelosteus' formidable advantage, its jaw, was enhanced by specialized plates in its mouth. Dunkelosteus had very large tooth plates dermal armor, but they were arrayed in these meat cleaver-like plates that were arranged in the jaws of Dunkelosteus that were used to crush and bite its prey. Dunkelosteus' tooth plates appear to be primitive teeth, but they are not. They were built for shearing rather than what teeth do, which is chew. True teeth had already evolved in the throats of jawless fish. Powered by throat muscles, they chopped up prey for easy digestion. But Dunkelosteus's tooth plates were powered by its killer jaws, cleaving its prey to bits. Unlike the ripping bite of predators like tyrannosaurs, 
the force of Dunkelosteus's bite was generated by the shearing action of its cleaver plates, similar to the cutting power of a giant pair of scissors. In some ways, it's almost like its own experiment in how to make a jaw. Armed with this new experiment, Dunkelosteus crunched and chopped its way through the bodies of the smaller armored fish of the Devonian period. It was probably doing some slow cruising around these reefs looking for a shark or a smaller placoderm to feed upon. When it spotted a prey item, it would have then thrust that tail in a couple of rapid tail strokes, darting toward the prey. Once Dunkelosteus was close to its prey, it would snap its jaws open with lightning speed. And how fast they opened may have been just as critical to the kill as how fast they shut. But how do scientists figure out the jaw speed of a long dead predator? With a little help from its 370 million year old bone. Mark Westmeat and his colleague Phil Anderson studied a group of fossilized Dunkelosteus skulls. They custom fit them with foam rubber muscles and entered their muscle measurements into a computer model. And we realized that Dunkelosteus was able to open its jaws quite fast, something like a tenth of a second. Dunkelosteus's jaw speed allowed something unexpected to happen. Suction which pulled its prey towards it. Then, before the prey had time to escape, Dunkelosteus's cleaver jaws would make the kill. Upper and lower were able to slide past one another. And that's when the high bite force would have been activated to bite a piece off of that prey item. One of the characteristics of large predators is often that they'll disable their prey by biting a piece off and then consuming it. Very much like two meat cleavers chopping the prey in half. The structure of Dunkelosteus' jaws made him a master of dismemberment. Anderson and Westneat determined the power of this predator's jaws after they discovered a naturally occurring lever system called a four-bar linkage that powered its bite. This type of linkage is incorporated in heavy equipment like tractors, and it increased the strength of Dunkelosteus's jaws by a third. They actually had a rather robust joint on the back of its skull connecting to the rest of the body. This would have allowed its skull to literally move upwards. And we've hypothesized that as that skull moved upwards, it would have actually forced the lower jaw to move down at the same time. By their calculations, Dunkelosteus' jaws packed a 5,000 Newton bite force. A 5,000 Newton bite force would be like a 1,000 pound boulder sitting on top of a meat cleaver sitting on top of your foot. By comparison, the bite force of a human is as little as a couple hundred newtons. Dunkelosteus's bite force was three times that of a great white shark. Dunkelosteus's jaw produced the most powerful known bite force ever. For any fish, living or extinct. Though incredibly successful for millions of years, Dunkelosteus and all the other placoderms disappeared from the Earth 360 million years ago. But the killing tool that Dunkelosteus pioneered, a powerful bladed jaw, has been recycled and can be found again and again in predators throughout time. There are a lot of birds whose bills essentially have razor sharp edges. There are certain turtles which have sort of the same kind of beak structure. These aspects of dental tool design seem to re-evolve over and over and over again because they're really effective at slicing meat. Megalograptus, 
the ruthless six-foot assassin that prowled the Ordovician oceans more than 460 million years ago is the largest arthropod that ever lived, the monstrous ancestor of modern scorpions and spiders. But size was only one of its deadly traits. Megalograptus was a lethal Swiss army knife, capable of attacking prey any number of ways. Versatility was its weapon. Monstrous Megalograptus had six pairs of specialized appendages. Legs for walking, paddles for swimming, an articulated tail for propulsion that was also spiked for fighting and trapping prey. Front appendages were lined with spikes. Finally, Chelicerae dismembered prey into pieces small enough to shovel into its mouth. 450 million years ago, the Earth of the Ordovician era, covered in ocean, was an alien world. There were no mammals, there were no reptiles, there were no birds, there were no amphibians. It's primarily a world of invertebrates. This primitive ocean, filled with trilobites and mollusks, was terrorized by versatile, heavily armed predators like Megalograptus. And like a weapon system in battle, Megalograptus would have had all its tools ready for deployment. The attack started as soon as it spotted its prey. This animal had compound eyes, just like the eyes of a, a fly or other arthropods, composed of many, many tiny little lenses. And they're curved and probably provided three-dimensional stereoscopic vision. Though it could walk on the sea floor, it also had the ability to undulate its tail and swim towards its victim. Once in range, it had kill opportunities for devouring its meal. Megalograptus was a mobile trap with appendages that could engulf and imprison its prey. Unlike anything in any other Eurypterids is the presence of these amazing spines on the appendages, long, sharp spines. These spines were jointed and strong. They probably could come together and hold something very effectively. But if its prey did escape, Megalograptus probably could have also used its spine as a sieve. It might have been a very good strategy for a predator to just plow into that uh, mud and kind of uh, rake it through using the spines as a basket and then picking out the delectable items. Once it grasped its prey, Megalograptus's many arms began shoving the helpless meal towards its mouth. But instead of teeth, Megalograptus's last set of appendages were chelicerae powerful pincers beside the mouth. They didn't chew the prey, but the little chelicery underneath would start the, the chewing uh, mechanism, start uh, tearing it up. We're not sure exactly how those appendages would have been used to manipulate the prey, whether or not they would have torn the animal open to get inside the soft parts, or whether or not they would have simply just crunched it and digested it. And if the front pincers needed reinforcements to defend its dinner, the tail could swoop in. The three pincers of the tail most likely moved in and out, as well as the third one up and down. They could grasp together very effectively and hold something very tightly. I like to think of the idea of the tail bending up over the head like a modern scorpion and basically uh, grasping something and flinging it away. Uh, from, from attacking the, the, the front end. Megalograptus disappeared 450 million years ago. But its incredibly successful predatory body plan, its lethal Swiss Army knife array of weaponry, survives to this day, recycled and redeployed. It is thought that scorpions living on land evolved from marine Eurypterids. 
scorpions and spiders inherited Megalograptus's grasping and trapping tools, helping to make arthropods the most plentiful animals on Earth today. Speed. It can be a killing tool as deadly as sharp teeth and powerful claws. Four hundred fifty million years ago, this gigantic hunter, thirty-foot Camaraceras, dominated the Ordovician Ocean. It cruised the waters over what is now North America, Europe, and Asia, like a primitive submarine. Encased in a protective shell for defense, this soft-bodied cephalopod had strong, flexible, squid-like limbs for grabbing prey. It had a large, complex eye and a sharp, powerful, beak-like mouth. But all of this was powered by some mighty plumbing, a jet propulsion system that allowed it to hunt down anything it wanted. Mighty Camaraceras' killing tool was this jet propulsion. You can imagine these very large cephalopods swimming quite agilely in the water column as big, huge telephone poles. A swimming telephone pole may be a little hard to imagine. But there is a modern cephalopod that provides insight into how ancient Camaraceras worked. This is a shell of a pearly nautilus, and it is the only modern cephalopod that has a hard shell. It's coiled, but otherwise it's very similar to our creature, which is basically a long cone pointed at one end, open at the other. This part of the cone, which is called a phragma cone, is divided into spaces. The other end, where the animal was, the soft parts, is called the body chamber. The soft tissue looked and functioned much like its cephalopod ancestors. There would have been an animal here with lots of arms hanging out, prominent eyes probably and a jaw mechanism, a big jaw mechanism. But how exactly do cephalopods like Camaraceras use jet propulsion to hunt down prey? There is a structure that comes out here that's a hollow tube, and the animal takes in water on either side of the body and squirts the water out this thing which is called a hyponome. So this creature, if it were swimming, would squirt, squirt, squirt. They have a specific organ known as a siphuncle, which is used to control gases in their chambers of their shell that allows them to control their buoyancy, allows them to rise in the water column as well as to sink in the water column. Camaraceras' accelerating jets helped satisfy its big appetite by making it faster than its prey. Our creature was the biggest guy on the block. This is a tiny specimen, and you can see how long it is. They were so big, they could mess with everybody else if they saw fit. To fill that big body up, one of its favorite meals was another super predator, Megalograptus. Megalograptus likely knew not to tangle with the huge predator, but Camaraceras pursued its victim. With its prey near, Camaraceras would deploy its many tentacles. When the animal is looking for food, it stretches out the tentacles as though it's trying to feel all parts of the environment. Eventually, one or more of the tentacles will touch the prey, at which point it quickly will surge forward and engulf the prey. Megalograptus did not give up easily. But it would have been no match for Camaraceras's crushing beak. 
The beak of Camelosaurus, similar to an upside down parrot's beak. Very large Camelosaurus would have been incredibly strong and would have probably had no problem crushing the hard exoskeletons of some of these um, arthropods. Though powerful and fast, Camarasaurus went extinct roughly 450 million years ago. But some cephalopods must have survived because today's squid and octopus all descend from a common half billion year old ancestor. And not surprisingly, these modern predators possess the same jet propulsion that made Camarasaurus such a terror. The Jurassic era produced such an abundance of lethal predators that the oceans were a virtual stew of assassins, from sharks and rays to early crocodiles. Joining this deadly crew was a massive Liopleurodon, which patrolled the Jurassic seas 160 million years ago over what is now Europe and Russia. A killing machine this maneuverable short-necked plesiosaur was armed with seven-foot jaws lined with teeth as long as those of a T-Rex. But it was Liopleurodon's surprising mobility, drawn from its four muscular paddles, that made it such a deadly assassin. It had two distinct modes, cruising and turbo-burst killing speed. Both helped it cut through the water and close in on its prey. And at 30 feet and 3 tons, it didn't take no for an answer. It was the biggest and the baddest of the large predators in the Jurassic Seaways. There's nothing that Lyplurodon, as an adult, has to worry about. So Lyplurodon is going to rule the Jurassic Seas in its time. The really unique thing about Lyplurodon is it flies with four wings under the water. There's no other known predator that's ever done that. But just how did Liopleurodon fly using its four paddles? One of the problems of working with fossils is the animals are dead, so they're just a ghost without everything else that goes with them. In his lab at Vassar College in upstate New York. Hello there, welcome to the biorobotics lab at Vassar College. Come on in. John Long breathes life back into Liopleurodon with the help of plastic, circuits, and batteries. With a robot, we can put meat and bones and brain back onto the ghost. I'll grab the flippers if you guys will just pull her out. John dubbed his super predator robot Madeline. All right. Roughly the size of a baby Liopleurodon, Madeline was equipped with four flippers. She was turned loose in the swimming pool to answer the question of just how Liopleurodon pursued its prey. If you look at otters, or you look at sea lions, or you look at turtles, all these critters have gone back in the water. They tend to, when they're cruising around, just use one set of flippers. The size and structure of Liopleurodon's flippers indicate that they were all being used for propulsion. But this is not the case. What we found really surprised us with Robot Madeline. You're not swimming any faster once you get up to speed than you are with two flippers. So it looks like four flippers were key for maneuverability and acceleration, and not swimming fast. Behaviors that come into play when Liopleurodon hunts and kills. And with relatively limited variety among the many creatures that inhabited the Jurassic oceans, Liopleurodon would have likely been forced to make a meal of similar plesiosaurs. It could not afford to be picky, nor could it expend more energy than it could get from its kill. No creature can. Energy matters in biology, right? So that's part of the logic behind saying, you know what, Liplurodon, if they were smart, weren't cruising around with four flippers. They were just using two. So it's incredibly expensive to move through water. Liopleurodon's eyes faced forward like most hunters so that it could track prey. And once it got close, Liopleurodon was ready to kick all four flippers into gear. If you have four flippers, that means likely you're gonna be good at hitting the turbo button and getting a quick burst of acceleration. Mm -hmm. 
Lyopleurodon would get all its flippers involved in thrusting, steering, twisting, and turning, giving it a surprising amount of mobility. You just take that momentum you have as a big critter and transfer that into a really cool maneuver. And that's going to throw off prey. They don't expect something large and relatively slow moving to be maneuverable at the last minute. In the struggle, Lyopleurodon would add another brutal advantage. Massive jaws crammed with teeth. The teeth are very large. They're three or four inches long. The root of the tooth is actually much longer, almost three times the length of the crown. So not only are the teeth large, but they have giant roots that hold the teeth into the skull very tightly. It's not repeatedly biting something, it's just holding on to something and working those teeth into the, the body. Now once Lyopleurodon has killed something, it has to break that carcass up, and it probably did that the same way a crocodile would, by twisting around, biting off big chunks, and then swallowing the chunks whole. A true sea monster, Lyopleurodon dominated the oceans for five million years. Although there are no vicious predators quite like Lyopleurodon swimming today's seas, there is an unlikely parallel out there right now. What's thought to be the best modern analog for plesiosaurs, and that's sea lions. Sea lions are mammals, and their osteology, the shapes of their bones, are completely different than what you see in Lyopleurodon. However, it's thought that the fin stroke the plesiosaurs used is very similar to what you see in sea lions. Convergent evolution recycles good ideas endlessly. But occasionally, something extraordinary happens. In the battle for survival, predators brandish such terrifying weapons as teeth, claws, and jaws. But even a long neck can be an assassin's tool when it's combined with a solid 10-ton body. Elasmosaurus was 45 feet long from tip to tail and lethal despite its small head and jaws. That's because it used its neck to attack out of nowhere. This neck was the longest of any sea creature that ever lived. Twice the length of a giraffe's with 10 times more vertebrae. Just one of many long-necked elasmosaurs that dominated the ocean for 35 million years. During the late Cretaceous period, from 100 to 65 million years ago, 85% of the planet's surface was underwater. Monsters ruled what little land remained. But most of the action was taking place in all that water. The Western Interior Seaway a shallow ocean that covered the middle of North America was a violent one. The Western Interior Seaway was truly the most dangerous seaway that ever existed. There was a tremendous amount of carnage going on constantly. In the midst of this carnage, one creature stood out for its killing style. This is Elasmosaurus platyurus. It's the first Elasmosaur ever found, collected in Kansas in 1867 and 1868. It's also one of the largest of the elasmosaurs that are known today. They were one of the longest, probably the heaviest creatures swimming in the seas of the Cretaceous. There's nothing like it in the animal kingdom. Even, you know, when we're talking about the long-necked dinosaurs that inhabited the Earth about the same time, they only have about a dozen or more vertebrae in their neck. And compared to this guy with 72, there's really no comparison between what Mother Nature was doing here. But just what was Mother Nature up to? Over the 125 million years that plesiosaurs swam Earth's seas, new generations kept adding vertebra to their ever-growing necks, ultimately reaching an unthinkable total of 72 in Elasmosaurus. More than half of its body was pure neck with a very small head. And that speaks a lot about its feeding strategy a strategy that was the culmination of millions of years of evolution. 
ocean-dwelling plesiosaurs first evolved from shore-dwelling reptiles roughly 235 million years ago. Most of the world is actually covered in ocean, so it represents a huge opportunity. Consequently, we've seen repeated reinvasions of aquatic or marine environments by animals uh, that were originally on the land. Over millions of years, evolution re-engineered them for success in the marine environment. In many cases, what we've seen is that the limbs actually become expanded and actually become paddles, and the, and the limbs become the major propulsive organ. A deliberate swimmer, Elasmosaurus propelled itself with four huge paddles, adaptations of its four legs. But when Elasmosaurus flew along in coastal waters, it was cruising for small prey. The skull is relatively small, the jaws are relatively narrow, and that limits the, the size of the maximum size of the fish to say something three or four inches in diameter, maybe 15 inches long. And so something as large as Elasmosaurus, weighing several tons, is almost going to have to eat continuously in order to fuel this huge body. Small headed Elasmosaurus hunted only small fish. But small fish had developed a defense against predators, schooling. If one set of eyes is good for detecting a predator, then hundreds of pairs in a school should be even better. The idea of being one of many is a very effective predator defense system. And what we see is the predators that will actually evolve to deal with these um, schools of fish. This was Elasmosaurus's challenge. But how did something this large sneak up on a school of wary fish? Fish's eyes are basically looking up and forward because uh, they, they prey on things at the surface too. And because of that particular feature, they have a blind spot below them. And that was just where Elasmosaurus would lurk. It could dive down in the dark and look up at its prey. And if there was a school of fish above it, it could easily recognize the silhouettes. Elasmosaurus's skin most likely was dark on its top side, camouflaging it to blend in with the depths. But its lethal weapon, its neck, allowed it to be in two places at once. The advantage of the long neck is that the body is 15 foot below where the head is and would be basically invisible. The last three or four feet of the neck enabled the, the head to be moved back and forth in a way to grab the fish once they got close. Elasmosaurus would rise out of the gloom like a lever, popping its head into the school to pick off a few unsuspecting fish. Their teeth are interlocking as kind of a fish basket, so they grab and a fish and swallow it immediately. There wouldn't be any chewing, there wouldn't be any tearing of, of flesh or tearing things apart. The whole fish would travel down its long neck and into a gizzard, a pouch containing stones the reptile had swallowed. That enabled them to grind up their food relatively quickly and probably helped in digesting pretty rapidly and again fueling this big body to to swim through the oceans. For millions of years, plesiosaurs' long necks made them virtually invisible and invincible killers. Only the global extinction event 65 million years ago, likely triggered by a massive asteroid impact, could finally end their stealthy ways. Elasmosaurus is the exception that proves the rule of convergent evolution of nature recycling effective weapons. Today, there's nothing on land or in the oceans with a body plan like that of Elasmosaurus. Even plant-eating giraffes have only seven vertebrae in their necks, the same as humans and most other mammals. Swans' necks have the most vertebrae, topping out at 25 
enabling them to reach places shorter necked ducks can't. What do you do if you're a prehistoric assassin with a mouth as big as your stomach? If you're a Zephactinus, you stuff yourself until you burst, literally. This monster's gaping mouth was its deadliest tool and its fatal flaw. Though it grew to be the biggest fish of its day, reaching lengths of 20 feet, Zephactinus was built for speed with wing-like pectoral fins, a wide blade of a tail, and a narrow back end. It also had a big mouth full of sharp, oversized teeth. It hunted the North American seaways for 35 million years. Success by any standard. But it was most notable for its outsized appetite to fill up that big mouth. Zephactinus ate the biggest fish it could possibly ingest, and it ate them whole a swift and efficient predatory adaptation. Over time, it got larger and larger and larger because it was very successful at what it was doing. But success clearly came at a price. There are at least 15 or 16 specimens now of large Zephactinus that died within a few hours, at most a day, of consuming a, a large fish. The mystery to this guy is the fact that so many of them die with a full stomach. Today, Zephactinus fossils are particularly well preserved in the ancient Cretaceous seabeds of western Kansas. They are the most common of the large predators found in the Kansas chalk. This is the Smoky Hill chalk. It's a sea bottom deposited 85 million years ago at a time when the most of the, the middle of North America was covered by an ancient ocean. It contains the bones, the fossils of some of the most dangerous predators of that time. It was a tough place to live. We've got about six foot here. We're looking at you know, 13 to 14 foot. It's a fact in us. This is a big fish, big fish. Their mouths are big enough that they could swallow a small child whole. Zephactinus's throat would expand as the mouth opened, courtesy of a series of small bones. This helped increase the volume of the interior of the mouth while swallowing prey. The lower jaw fit back inside the upper jaws when Zephactinus closed its mouth. Chances are it had a target of a certain size of prey animal that would give it maximum nourishment for minimum risk. And that size, for a 12 to 15 foot fish, was a four to six foot prey animal. You would eat one fish, be done, and go away. Nobody knows how long it took Zephactinus to digest an intact fish. But this strategy was extremely efficient. It reduces the number of meals and the energy expended in hunting. They would eat one prey animal at a time and then slip into a period of very little activity until they needed to eat again. That was their very successful survival strategy. But why have some fossils turned up with a supersized meal inside them? Could their eyes have been too big for their stomachs? I think visual attack was an important part of Zephactinus because they really had very large eyes for the size of the animal. It was also very fast. And if it was quite a ways away from its prey, it could actually position itself in front of the prey. It would have been able to close in on its prey, a five-foot gilligus, with brutal efficiency. It would attack from below with that upward pointing mouth. It would be able to open it at the last minute. Too late for the gilligus to, to realize what was happening. The Gillicus would literally be sucked into Zephactinus's mouth and at that moment be trapped by Zephactinus's teeth. The teeth are huge in relation to the size of the jaw and in relation to the size of the animal. After it sucked the fish in partway, those long teeth would hold it, would grab it and puncture it and in some cases kill it so that it wouldn't struggle so much. 
But why did this brutal attack sometimes prove fatal for the Zephactinus as well? From time to time, the prey animal was maybe just a hair too large and or too active and may have seriously caused the damage that killed the, the Zephactinus. Or maybe the Zephactinus was not fully armed at the moment it swallowed its prey. Maybe its teeth were in a middle replacement stage and they weren't able to stun it as much as it normally would have. So when that large prey fish was going down the, the gullet, it, it actually managed to do some serious anatomical damage to the internal organs of the, of the uh, Zephactinus. Whatever the cause of death, Zephactinus was a voracious hunter. The ability to consume large fish whole was the deadly trait that made this killer an apex predator. But despite its success, Zephactinus went extinct, along with most of the large predators, at the end of the Cretaceous period. Yet its design lives on. Today, a fish aptly named the Black Swallower uses the same killing tool that allows it to gorge on fish larger than itself. And like Zephactinus, this extreme form of predation also has its downside. Occasional death for the swallower. Super predators sit at the top of the food chain because of their specialized weaponry, honed by eons of evolution. The tools that made these aquatic hunters efficient killers still dominate Earth's oceans, even though their original owners are long gone. Recycled, these tools have simply been installed in later predatory models, because nature wastes none of the weapons of its very best assassins.